Hi, I'm Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, everybody. Well, what's an early morning for us here to podcast? Usually we do this thing in the afternoon, so. I like a morning podcast, especially when we're talking about turkeys. Yeah, I, I do. And I'm so thankful that we're going to start talking about turkeys. Oh, yeah. Turn the page. I right love direction. the spring. This is probably our favorite topic. Uh, I would think so. Today, and, and and I would venture to say this is our favorite guest, yes. especially when we're talking about turkeys. Today, we've got, we're going to have Dr. Michael Chamberlain on here. There it there is. is. We, we probably need to come up with a better horn with for Dr. Goblin. Mike. Um, you know, like, like a horn with a gobble? Next, next time he comes on, it'll, it'll be like a tear above the horn. <laughs> 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 Dr. Mike Chamberlain, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. How about y'all? Yeah, we are. Well, it's a little bit closer to turkey season. Deer so season's over with. Well, almost over with in Alabama. So everybody's licking their wounds and thinking about turkeys. Yeah. It's been a long deer season. <laughs> Bobby's oh, guiding service is worn out. I am worn out. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to turkey season. So, uh, Well, and we've also got David Holly on there uh, uh, somewhere, I think. David, are you here? I am. Okay. Well, here. David is with uh, Mossy Oak Our very Properties, own. yeah. And he's also got this really cool... Uh, uh, called the Wild Turkey Report on Instagram. And before, you, you need to follow that. And before I forget it, guys, today's Tuesday, Dr. Michael Chamberlain has uh, on his Instagram and Facebook, it's Turkey Tuesdays. Hey. It, and look, you got to follow that. It's some great information. No I, doubt about it. I look forward to that every day. That that probably takes a while to do, Doc, doesn't it? It does. It does. Um, it's... it's um, it's time consuming mentally to try to come up with topics that are not repetitive. So I try to, I try to pick something that's timely, which requires me to start thinking Tuesday afternoon for the following Monday night. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it's a struggle sometimes, sometimes the topics just lend themselves and, uh, but yeah, I, I enjoy doing it actually. I, um, I don't enjoy the, the the negative comments i get sometimes but but that's okay we all have our different perspectives and our different way of looking at things and uh i think it's been i think it's been good because i i get a lot of messages and i get a lot of engagements every week and that means people care about the resource and that's a that's a good thing yeah no, it, it certainly is, you know, and uh, look, you you get a lot of engagement. There's a lot of comments on some of those things. And I'm, I know you read them all and you pay attention to it, but I, I expect you probably it, um, reading those comments probably opens you up to more topics each week. You, it probably it does. Gives, gives you some it ideas. Does. Yeah, yeah. And people, people will message me and say, well, what about this? What about that? And that's resulted in a lot of posts that I've made, you know, somebody will off topic say, Hey, I've always wondered about this or that. Um, and I do have to post the same material. Sometimes I'll try to use different pictures, but I'll, I'll have to go through the same topics. Like, um, one I'm thinking about in the next few weeks, you know, with hunting season right around the corners, um, people ask about vision and hearing and, you know, turkeys have amazing vision as we all know. Um, but their eyes function entirely different than ours. And if you, if you kind of think about how their ears and their eyes work together, it's no wonder they pick us out the way they do. It's no wonder that if you, you know, you flinch a little bit, he's gone. It's because of the way they perceive their environment. So it's stuff like that. I, I don't mind posting, you know, each year because I think it's timely and and somebody new reads it and they value it and that's that's good. Yeah, that make a lot, makes a lot of sense. You know, there's a lot of topics. You know, we're always talking about habitat things and some things. You know, may have been a big deal ten years ago, 
and it seems a little overused to us, but there's a lot of people coming into the sport and the idea of active management. And so it's, it's good to revisit all of that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, and y'all deal with this too, that, you know, you, you get somebody that wasn't paying attention to gamekeepers, for instance, a year ago, and now they are. So the content that you may have put out five years ago becomes relevant to them now. Mm-hmm. And it, it wasn't a year ago. So there is value in, in some repetition in what we do and because we do reach a new audience. And, you know, I, I talk about this with students too. A student will, will sometimes complain, well, I had this in a previous class. Well, that's good because if you hear it twice and you hear it from different perspectives, you'll learn it and it will become part of you and part of your your fabric if you hear material over and over and over, particularly through different lenses. And I think, I think we as stewards uh, could, could kind of take a lesson from that. Sometimes it's good to go back and read the, the things you've already learned, if you will. Yeah, we were talking about how the discussion of uh, prescribed fire has, has gotten a little overused uh, lately. But again, it's such an important topic, and we need to keep talking about it and, and learning more about it. So anyway. Yeah, for sure. Hey, this is Toxie Hayes with Mossy Oak. You know, hunting and fishing, gamekeeping, and taking care of the land with my family is my life. And I'll be honest with you, the one app that I'm on every day and use more than anything is on X. It literally has changed my life. From property ownership to roads, everything to do with understanding the land better. I even use it to plot acreages all the time. Every function I could dream of. Use coupon code Mossy Oak to save 20% on your next Onyx subscription. Trust me, you'll be so glad you did. Doc, before we uh, we we kick this thing off, when we first got you up on Zoom, you kind of said, "Hey, I need to ask you guys about something," and we all kind of held our breath because we we felt like we were in school and we were in trouble. But yeah, I've got a bone to pick with y'all, <laughs> yeah. you mossy oak guys, yeah, so, more specifically. Do, do you want to you want to ask us about that, or is that something that that we should talk about? To, from, and maybe perhaps what you've learned because we don't want to spread any mis- misinformation, and we're we're having uh, we're we're trying to learn about turkeys and explain things that we've heard mm-hmm. about for, before. And I'll bring it up. We we brought up the quote-unquote legend of the mossy head and i think you've had some people inquire to you trying to learn a little mm-hmm. bit more about it and we'd love to hear your perspective on that yeah so i i started out by by uh telling you guys i had a bone to pick with you um i did that intentionally just to see w- what your reaction was but, um, <laughs> we, we yeah, gonna pick I, a lot. it worked <laughs> yeah. yeah it worked i had deer in the headlights looks um so so yeah I, you know i i periodically get asked and just today actually got asked about the, the mossy head turkey as a subspecies and um and that's what i you know i knew that y'all had said something about that on a on a previous podcast so that i wanted to ask you about it but um but basically you know that what we had discussed before you started taping was just this notion that you know wild turkeys they have a lot of plumage characteristics that vary across the species range. And, and, you know, through our own activities of restoring turkeys, we've, we've really muddied the water, if you will. Um, because during restoration, we move turkeys all over the place. You know, there's records of, of birds from South Florida being moved all over the Southeast and, and, you know, on and on and on. There were just, there were birds moved everywhere. And although there's, in many cases, there was evidence that some of those releases failed. You know, all the birds that were released either died or, or, or were no longer there. There are a lot of records of birds being moved, and they did. They were successful. So you tend to see a lot of variation in, in turkeys, uh, even within local areas where you've, um, where you've got pockets of birds that their genetics could be traced back potentially to some of the birds that were used to create those local populations. Um, and I, I think that's a snapshot of what we talked about. And, you know, the other thing is you, you've got turkeys that have interacted with, with domestic type varieties for decades, 
all over the place, you know, whether it was Naren Gassets or Bourbon Reds or whatever, you know, plantation type birds, if you will, that were allowed to mingle with native birds. And we still see every year, you, you, you see the pictures too. I get pictures sent to me every year with, with birds that have quote unquote odd plumage characteristics. And I get asked, well, what is that? And I, I don't know. So in some cases it, it looks like it could be traced back to, you know, interactions with domestic birds. And in some cases it could just be an odd, you know, plumage character that's, that's traced to genetics in that area. Um, it's really, it's an interesting topic to me because we don't know, and Dudley mentioned this, you know, we just don't know in a lot of cases what happened in these local areas, but we do know that that um, the turkeys were moved to a lot of different parts of the United States and those source populations vary. Uh, and they, you know, you take genetics from one area and you put it in somewhere else and, and some of those genetics are still, are still prominent in some of our, our local populations. Well, it's interesting how um, back in the day when these birds were being relocated, there must have been a lot of birds in South Florida. At that at that time, that cattle ground down there, it, it was just a it's just a great environment for turkeys and and for Florida to share those birds like that. That that was a, that was a lot of co- a cooperation between states in trying to uh, reestablish pockets of birds. That that, that just kind of makes me happy to think about all that going on, all that cooperation. Oh yeah, I mean there were there were you know, between the state agencies and NWTF and, and other nonprofits and hunters, turkey hunters, landowners, private landowners that allowed state agencies to come in and grab birds and, and move them. I mean, that level of cooperation is why we have turkeys where we do today. And, you know, some of the conversations that are being had, whether it's in person or on social media, about the struggles that we're seeing with turkeys in a lot of areas, it's going to take that same level of cooperation to, to see our populations rebound to where we want them to be in many areas. And we will, because we're all dedicated to the resource. And, and that level of dedication is, there's a model for that because we've been down that road before. Lanny, this morning was just, we were talking about people that watch our television show or read our magazine, listen to this podcast, that, that we, we would think that just about to a man, if you said, hey, look, we need to do a little sacrificing mm-hmm. for the future of these church, we think 100% of our people would do that. I would hope so. I, I mean, I really do. Mm-hmm. I would too. We, we just, would. We've just got we, we, to spread the word more. If, if, if there are problems in areas, we just gotta, we've just got to spread the word. And I, I think the word's already out. You know, there's everybody's getting more into – habitat improvements or, you know, whatever it may be that you think you need to personally do to improve things. People are doing it more, you know, yeah, burning, yeah. shooting one less bird, trapping some, you know, all kinds of stuff. Save the poles. <laughs> yeah. So all the research that you've been a part of through the years, and you've been researching wild turkeys a long time, is, is there things that you've learned researching the bird that you can apply to your hunting that makes you a better hunter? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's two big ones. When you when you contacted me about doing this podcast, or, you know, I, I've been asked this question before. Um, there, there are two things that really jump out. One, and we can we can go through these. One is that this notion that uh, turkeys will circle back to to calls to vocalizations hours and hours and hours after they heard it. It's just that you weren't part of the agenda um, initially, and suddenly you can become part of the agenda hours later, which speaks to the notion that sometimes patience is a virtue. Um, that's one. Two is the notion that you think you're hearing the same bird multiple nights in a row at the same spot, when in reality, in many cases, you are not. You're hearing different birds that are roosting in the same location. And that really speaks, when, when we realize that, that speaks to me about don't put all your eggs in one basket and assume that from one day to the next, a bird is going to behave the same. 
because sometimes you're hunting two different birds when you think you're hunting the same bird from one night to the next. Um, and that really, how many times have y'all been out there? I, I can't tell you how many times I've done this where you hunt a bird and he flies down and he goes east and you chase him all morning. You never catch up to him. You, you know, you, you have a good day, you go back and the next morning you're sitting there again and he's about 50 yards or maybe 80 yards or whatever different, but he's roosting the same general spot. All right. A joker's headed east this morning. <laughs> I'm going to get east of him and he flies down and goes west. And sometimes, yeah, that could just be that he had a different agenda. Sometimes that could be, yeah, maybe he heard you he tree yelping or whatever and, and decided that wasn't a bird. Or it could just be that it's a different turkey. And he didn't realize that the bird, nor does he care, that the day before his, his buddy went east, his agenda says to go west. And we have seen this repeatedly with turkeys, that they will, a tom will vacate a roost and go somewhere else for a night. And that night, some other tom comes in and roosts in the exact same spot. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, we, we see that repeatedly. And it, um, we think we know why that is. Um, this is a bit speculative on my part, but I think it, it makes sense to me. Well, we like the that, speculative stuff. Of course. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, it, it makes sense. So, you know, you and I, we look at the landscape through our lens, <laughs> And they look at the landscape very differently than we do. And if you're a Tom, you're trying to roost in places that give you access to hens, but you're also trying to be safe. And you're also trying to project your sound across the landscape. And we think that these roost sites, for whatever reason, for reasons we can't always perceive, there are just some roosts that project sound better and there's less attenuation, meaning there's less uh, disruption of the sound as it's going across the landscape. And if so, then it makes sense that you'd see birds that roost in the same general spot, you know, because there are some places that are just better, if you will, mm -hmm. than others. Mm -hmm. And you see this with Easterns. I mean, if you look at their roost sites, they don't roost all over their home range like you like they could. I mean. You y'all know this. You go into a spot and you look up in a tree where he was. And you're like, well, that, that there's a thousand trees across this home range that look kind of like that. Uh, why did he roost there and not down the ridge a little ways? Well, they know they have some perception that we don't. Um, so that that's a big one I've learned. That don't think it's the same bird every night. Sometimes it's going to be a different bird, and that would that would then explain sometimes why they just behave so differently than, the, <laughs> than they did the day before, because it's a different bird. That has happened so many times. Oh yeah. And I always think it's my fault. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. And you talk about I the screwed, one, I that one all year, you know what I mean? And it could be four or five different ones that you've been hunting in the same spot. You've been yeah. there, Bobby. Mm. I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I look. One of my favorite, Mike. One of my favorite things. If I get a little history with a bird, then I really get. He commits. It commit to that bird, <laughs> and I feel like I've learned something every time I go. Learn, learn a little bit more, and then all of a sudden, there's a you know completely out of left field. They go the opposite direction, like what Mike's describing. Mm -hmm. That kind of explains a lot. Oh, no doubt about it. Yeah, and how many times have you sat there? You know, if you hunt the same spot for let's just you know let's say a week five days or whatever the first two days there's a there's a bird gobbling in the same general spot you th we think logically it's the same bird and then the third day he's gone or you think he's gone you don't hear him is he there and he's not gobbling did he move and then the fourth day he's down the ridge 100 yards well ch chances are it's not even him um, mm -hmm. he blew out of there after a day or two and he's coming back. We see that he's coming back. He, he will be back to that roost location, but there's no predicting when that's going to be. Sometimes it's a day or so. Sometimes it's a week later. Um, I have a student that's actually doing this, right? He, he's looking at this and I think it's really interesting. The, the idea, uh, it looks like 
there are some roost sites that are just hubs, if you will. Like this is a spot that's really important to this bird. And he's got maybe two or three of those in his home range. And then there's all these other roost that are that he uses. He may only use this one twice this, you know, this month. And then he goes over here for a night and he goes over here for a night. But there are some that are just hubs, if you will. And I think if we could identify what it is about those hub roost and manage for them and conserve them on the landscape, I think that would be important, not just from a turkey perspective, but from an education and hunter perspective, because it will allow us to really pick the landscape apart and say, this is where these places could be. Now we need to make sure we keep those places. Um, it's a really interesting idea. It almost and it it if you've hunt and you all have you've hunted Merriams and Rios, you know, Rios will go back to the same roost almost mm -hmm. every night. Part of that is they don't have a lot of roost in their home ranges in many cases, but part of it could just be that there are these hubs, and those hubs are really important to the bird. So talk about that that home range a little bit too. You know, and I, I guess it's got to vary geographically, you know, and, and resource based too. But what's an average size of a of a home range of a of a of a turkey or of a long beard? Or is Man, it it's all it it is all over the place. Um, like right now, you know, we're in early February and birds are still in their winter flocks, and um, they kind of come and go in the foraging areas, and, and in some cases, they're using a lot of area, like here. In Georgia, our our hard mast is gone and has been for weeks now. So our birds are covering some ground. They're, you know, they're they're searching for resources and when they find them, they kind of low, you know, they settle down, but they're they're trucking at thousands of acres. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at their home range in a month, they may cover five thousand acres in a month. Wow. Um here in a few weeks, we're going to start seeing, you know, that shift. And if I had to just pick a number. If you kind of look in the spring, think about a thousand acres, 1500 acres. A lot of our toms here in the South, they'll kind of hang in that, but then you'll have a, a guy that covers three times that. And you'll also, we see some turkeys, um, we see some turkeys that have very small home ranges. Sometimes have tiny, tiny home ranges. So Laney, to your question, you know, what is the average? There is no average. Mm -hmm. uh, every one of them is different. And that's a real, that's another take home, I guess could be a third thing I've learned about turkeys. It relates to hunting is there is no such thing as an average Tom. They're mm -hmm. all different. And that helps explain if you, the insanity that we observe. And, yeah. And it makes me feel a lot house. better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does make you feel better. It's an ego boost when yeah. you go, it's not me, it's yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's them. Wow. Dudley, well, you, do, you, do you find that the uh, home range shrinks on gobblers, the older they get, do they kind of become almost, this, almost that hermit style turkey that, you know, they, they know where to be, where not to be, where their hens are going to be, and they kind of stick to that in their spring pattern? We don't, we don't really know, David. Um, the problem is the technology that we have, we can only get about two years, two springs worth of data out of a single GPS unit. Mm -hmm. And we don't know when we mark the bird how old they are unless they're a jake. You know, if we, we can guess, we can kind of say, well, yeah, that based on his spur, he's most likely two or he's most likely three, but we don't know. So I, we don't quite have the technology to answer your question. We will, we're, we're getting there. We're, in fact, I think, knock on wood and find some wood, I think we might be there, but we'll, we'll see. I'm, we're using some GPS this spring that it, I, I think we're going to be able to get multiple years out of it. And if we do, uh, that would be cool because we do catch, we recapture some of these birds as you, as you know, and, if we could recapture some birds and get three or four or God forbid, five years of data off a single bird, that would really be cool. Yeah. Well, it's the place we need to do it is it, we're, we're studying on a non hunted site. I have a, a huge project on a non hunted site and we're, we are catching toms repeatedly on that site from one year to the next. 
And because they're not being harvested, their survival is almost a hundred percent. No, Wait, where was this? Wait, what spot? Where? where? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll drop you a pen. Up. <laughs> yeah. We all looked at each other yeah. like, oh, we need an onyx pen on that one. We we <laughs> always say there's no place not getting hunted. <laughs> Somebody's hunted. Well, there actually is. Yeah, the Savannah River site in South Carolina is. Um, it's a two hundred thousand acre property that. Prior to COVID, there was a two-day wounded warrior hunt each year that across 200,000 acres that resulted in about 20, 25 toms being taken. So for all intents and purposes, not hunted at all. But since the pandemic has started, it has not been hunted at mm-hmm. all. And coincidentally, we started working on the site prior, just prior to COVID, and those birds have not experienced any take at all no disturbance other than just the day-to-day activities of people moving around and as you can imagine survival is really high because unless they unless they end up in the bombing range or something (laughs) yeah yeah you know you lose toms here and there to to horned owls and various things but their survival is extremely high on this site as you would predict i mean we we're the most efficient predator of male wild turkeys there's no question we are so yeah, th- you thank you. Nice, you yeah, yeah. Thanks, well, some of us are. Bob. <laughs> uh, yeah, some of us are very efficient. So, uh, you know, not all. Not me. <laughs> not me. No, I me, do have a red dot, either. so I'll, I'm, I'll be more prepared this year. So, Dudley, did you have a question? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the tree thing. I can't help it. But um, have you read or heard or do you have any speculation on, uh, like, roost? And, and this is a tough question because we're talking about such a broad area, but uh, I'm always going to think about the southeast because that's where I'm from and hunt mostly. But uh, are there any tree species uh, that seem to be favored for roost trees or any particular aspects or, you know, what what part in the elevation? It, uh, anything like that uh, for spring turkeys that you've noticed or, or yeah. read about? Yeah, we don't we don't really measure the tree per se. Like we don't go. We have we've done work where we went and tried you know use the GPS location to try to find the tree the bird was in. Um, we're just finishing up some stuff on Goulds actually that is really cool showing. And I know you know most of your audience probably hasn't hunted Goulds or had the opportunity to do that, but. Uh, what we found there was, yes, there were very strong predictors of where they were going to roost, whether it was a, a north facing, you know, slope, whether it was elevation, there were cover types, certain force types that they would roost in. Uh, and we're actually using, you know, that to really inform the agency of, hey, you can predict where these birds are going to roost before you ever move, because, you know, ghouls are still being restored. Um before you ever move birds to this landscape, here's where they're going to roost. And that's, you know, very valuable for, for our Easterns and, you know, that kind of work in your neck of the woods, we see it, it is all over the place. I had one study site where most, believe it or not, most of the roost, this was a longleaf site. So think mature longleaf, you know, tall trees, uh, kind of oak, kind of, you know, wet, marshy areas with with hardwoods around you know kind of dotted through this pine matrix most of those toms roosted in the pine trees and they would get up you know 50 feet in these long leaf and i i was stunned because i i think probably like you would imagine they would go to these sprawling hardwoods you know with limbs that were that were conducive to them roosting in in those but like we were talking about, maybe from a sound perspective, that didn't make sense to that Tom. Maybe from a sound perspective, it made more sense to get up higher in those in those long leaf where their sound was projected above the mid-story vegetation. You know, so again, we just kind of look at things differently than the bird does. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I was I was doing some hack and squirt at my farm last weekend. It's almost too late to do that, but uh uh, there's an area where I frequently hear turkeys gobble, and I found this big old wolf sycamore 
that, uh, you know, kind of it fits the book for getting rid uh-huh. of it. So you can get more vegetation on the ground and whatnot. And I just couldn't do it. It just looked, in my mind, it looked like too good of a turkey roost tree uh-huh. in, in a good uh-huh. area. So anyway, yeah. that kind of reminded me of that question. That's one of the, that's one of the things that, you know, roosting ecology is there's been a lot of research done on, on roosting ecology, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been very comprehensive. So in other words, there'd be a, you know, a graduate student that would do a little work here and a graduate student that would do a little work there. We, we actually are sitting on, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of roost locations that that's the strongest data set that i have actually is because we get a roost location every single night on every single bird so we know where this bird is every night and it just takes time to go through that volume of data but i I, and i do have a student that's that's going to do that and I really think that's going to be one of the most interesting things that I've ever done in my career when he finishes that work, because I think there's so much we haven't tapped into from a science perspective that turkey hunters like us will eat up because that's one of the, I mean, that's when we start engaging with the bird, you know, I mean, that's, 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 that's when we start is when he's in that tree and, and we, we work a, a lot of our work, if you will, is around, finding him in that tree and setting up on him and, you know, seeing if he's going back there that night and where, like to your point, Dudley, where is that? Where is that in his home range? What's the tree look like? What's the area look like? What's the elevation? What's the aspect? Um, What's the slope? All these things that would really inform turkey hunters to be able to look at their landscape and say, where is this, where's the bird going to, to roost most likely? I'm really looking forward to that. It just takes time because of the, the volume of data we have is just so, it's just so much. Um, well, I think that's a good thing. We're not running out of things to study and learn from. No, there's plenty. There's more than I have time left. That's for sure. <laughs> so, Mike, what I, one thing I'd like to ask you to talk about. So we're here in the, er, the early days of February. The season is not that far away at all but so are the the long beards they're all still bunched together running into kind of in, in groups what's what's going to take place over the next few weeks that makes just from a turkey hunter's perspective what can we think about that's going on so that when the season starts we have a better idea of 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 what what that flock's doing yeah chances are if you're seeing toms right now you there's a good chance you will not be seeing them in that same spot in a month. Um, right now they're, they're tied in the resources and they're being food and safety. And in many cases, you'll see them shadowing hen flocks right now. You'll see them strutting and, and displaying, even though breeding is weeks and weeks and weeks down the road. Soon those winter flocks are going to blow up and three of those birds, let's say there's 10, three of those birds are headed east. Two of those birds are headed south. The other, the other five are headed northwest, and they're going to areas that they expect to be breeding home ranges, where they expect to interact with hens, where they expect to be able to, to do their thing. And um, so you do often see birds just disappear. And, you know, we Y'all know this. I get questions about it a lot. Hey, there were turkeys here and they're gone. Where'd they go? Well, they're probably close by. Um, You just happen to have winter habitat and they moved off your property to get to spring habitat because it is dramatically different from, I mean, if you look at what they're using now to what they're going to use a month from now, it is, it is different in many cases, not always, but in many cases it is. You know, that's the one thing when he started explaining that last year. And as we talk about managing properties, you either you either have winter habitat or you have spring and summer habitat. And some guys don't have spring habitat, just don't mm-hmm. have turkeys. And, and it, you know, it can go either way. But being able to manage for what you have and being to help those birds when they show up, even if it's not hunting season, that's so important. For, 
and we and as game keepers we need to be thinking about that and I don't know that it's really ever I really I don't think I understood that until Dr. Chamberlain explained mm-hmm. that to us. That was valuable for that, me to learn. Yeah, you know, we we've talked about this in various forms, but you know, what is it going to take for us to make sure we have turkeys decades from now? In many ways, it's going to take us realizing that we're all going to have to give a little bit. And hopefully we all give more than we take. And one of the ways you can give is to identify your strengths and play to those strengths. So just to your point, like, like I have a property here near my house that I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to turkey hunt. I've never killed a turkey out there, uh, which is, you know, on surface is frustrating because I work really hard on this property and I burn and I plant and, and, there are turkeys there every fall and then they're gone you know so i see sign i get pictures they're there and when the season opens they're down the road you know and and there's i've tried everything i can possibly think of to encourage them to be there in the spring and sometimes there are but not often and that's on the surface that's frustrating and then i step back and realize well you know what that drip torch you know, that stand, those stands that I burned, that's benefiting that, that local population. And at some point that's going to benefit me. Um, so I just, I stay the course and I keep doing what I'm doing, recognizing that, you know, in some, some ways I'm benefiting my neighbor, but I, I try not to look at it like that. I look at it from the standpoint of 10 years from now, I want to make sure I've still got turkeys on camera. Mm-hmm. I want to see tracks in the road. I want to hear a bird, even if he's on the neighbor. And the way I can do that is to play to my strengths. And that's what I do. You, you, that's a great attitude. And and we all know that things change. The neighbor could cut timber. Oh, yeah. The, the landscape the, you changing know, it, all the it, time. It's always mm-hmm. So if you're good to those birds, through those, if something could change, and all of a sudden it, things turn in a big way for you. And bigger than that, it's making a decision about the benefit of the whole species and, and everything and not just, you know, your what how you directly benefit from it. So we all the more we're finding out about fall habitat is that it's way more important, I think, to uh, to eggs and clutch survival than than we realized in the past. So um, Oh yeah. Yeah, big birds are better. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the bottom line. Birds that are heavier, birds that come out of winter in better shape. They are much Be better more likely. I mean, we know this with birds in general, that you come out of winter in better shape, you stand a better chance of being successful, reproductive, you know, when you're reproducing. And so, yeah, I mean, if you can do a really bang up job helping your local flock come through winter, then you are, I mean, you're benefiting the local population, even though those birds may not be on your property in the spring. Um, and it like to Bobby's point, at some point, well beyond just the the kind of the the attitude of well at some point i'll be able to kill a bird you know on this property um i kind of look at it bigger picture well 10 years from now 20 years from now i'll still be seeing birds on this property mm-hmm. and that's that to me is the way to look at at turkeys and other species is that if i can make sure they're still here and they're still thriving then that's i've given back what I've taken. Yeah, that's no a, doubt. That's that's a great perspective. David, did you have a question for the doc? Well, really, you know, I think what he's saying is is really um, a great point because, you know, kind of like the old saying, it takes a village to raise kids. Well, it takes a village to raise turkeys. And, it, you know, when you're talking about an animal that has the home range that, that Mike described, you, you really need to think of it in like the collaborative sense. So, I mean, the whitetail world's kind of got this down these days with the cooperative sort of mindset. Um, I see more and more of that on the turkey. Uh, just from my, you know, limited perspective and limited position, I mean, I've been trying to encourage, you know, neighbors and everyone around me to do these things because, yes, it may not benefit me today or benefit them today, but it's going to be all of us tomorrow if our population grows. Because, Mike, wouldn't you say when you have a, I mean, when you have a really really strong population that their their home range 
you know, they're, because of territorialism, they're not going to be constrained to these typical places over and over. It's going to force them into places that they may not have been five years ago when the population was 20, 30% less. Would that be a factor? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's that's what we're seeing in many ways across the Southeast is, you know, when populations were being restored and they were exploding, you know, and there were quote unquote turkeys everywhere, those populations expanded into areas where uh, they had not been. You and I got used to hearing birds and seeing birds and harvesting birds in those areas and now they're gone. And it's like, well, what happened to them? Well, the population is declining and you're seeing birds, uh, for lack of a better word, you're seeing light bulbs that are blinking out in some areas uh, because maybe the habitat's changed, whatever. I mean, you, you pick a scenario, pick multiple scenarios. So yes, if we do a better job at, at benefiting the populations that we have and we can get those populations to expand, then we could go the same direction we went during restoration, which is ending up in birds with birds in areas where they currently are not. My, Mike, do you think that on the landscape that the way we manage land right now can support that same level that we had in, say, the 70s and 80s? No. No. Unfortunately, you know, we've changed everything. You know, you all know this. The landscape is so different now than it was. Um, and there's so many competing land uses now. You know, I, I look at like South Florida, for instance, I, you know, I posted about today and, and looking at South Florida and thinking about turkeys in South Florida, it's the dawning realization that in some parts of this bird's range, we have competing land use that we're going to lose. And the bottom line is the competition, we're, we're going to lose the competition in some areas because the bird is not the same priority as human infrastructure and urbanization type of thing. But in other parts of the species range, like where you are, David, um, yeah, you you can you can manage parts of the landscape in a way to where that local population thrives. It's just going to take the realization to your point that we can't do this alone. And the landscape, if you if you look at the southeast, you you y'all do this. Get up in a plane and fly across the Southeast right now and look down. And what you will see is compared to what you see 20 years ago is night and day. I mean, yeah. just the, the the way the landscape looks, it's, it's fragmented, highly fragmented, even though it doesn't look like that maybe to us. If you get big picture, just scan on through Google Earth for the last 20 years and you will see just things that are, are different and and in many ways, those changes have not been good for turkeys. They've been good for other things. And so, yeah, we I don't think we're going back where we were. We're in a new normal, but we can make that new normal positive. It's just going to take effort on our part, and, and we can do that. We've done it before. Mike, to that point, you know, I mean, obviously everyone's a little bit different about this but um in, in our part of the world and, and bobby and lane are in the same boat that we are we we lease timber company land and you know i mean they have a different set of objectives than the the private landowner and we're in the the heart of the deep south wood ba wood basket um i did something the other night just was curious i went in our our county where bobby and laney and i hunt and did an outline around all the what i would consider uh, timberland. I'm, I'm not talking like a private individual that has 500 acres or whatever. I was talking like Timos, you know, you're, and I'm not going to name names, but it was pretty intriguing to look at the amount of large blocks and conglomerates that these companies own. So without, you know, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus or anything like that, but when you have landowners that have such large influence across a pretty impactful range for the wild turkey in the deep south how can we get you know these large landowners whether they're the timberland companies or even just a guy that has a thousand fifteen two thousand acres all on board realizing hey together we're part of this conglomerate that that is the wild turkey yeah i mean the bottom line is as you know money drives the world and um you know the 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 conduit 
to convincing somebody to, or the vehicle, if you will, to convincing somebody to manage their land a certain way is to make it economically, you know, feasible for them to do that. And there has been work looking at research, looking at um, kind of meshing wildlife and timber objectives. Um, I think in many ways, it's, it's just going to take us being turkey hunters and, and enthusiasts working with taking the science, if you will, to these landowners and saying and showing that there are a, there are possibilities for managing, let's just say at a lower basal area or um, implementing fire, at, you know, more routinely, um, different site preparation techniques up front that can change plant communities to benefit wildlife. That, that science is out there. It's just taking that and convincing landowners to implement it. The bottom line is that it has to be, the economics have to add up for them. And, you know, you, you, you think about that and you go, gosh, man, that, that sucks. Well, you know, it, the bottom line is that's, that's their, the land use objective is to make money, mm -hmm. you know, and um, that again, we can do it. it. It's just going to take working with them and, and prioritizing the bird and more importantly, the, the habitats, the landscapes that they thrive in and seeing if we can shift the needle, if you will, on private lands a little closer to where, you know, what's good for the bird than it is now. Um, that can happen. It's just going to, you know, it all, to me, it all ties back to economics. I think some of the light at the end of the tunnel for that issue is the fact that uh, a lot of these big TMOs, uh, lease the hunting rights, lease the recreational sure. rights. And that is part of the economic, the economics of the whole thing. And so if it's, sure. if it's a better recreational tract, people are going to be willing to spend more money per acre per year to be able to use that for, for hunting. And so it, it would make sense to, for them to make those SMZs a little bit wider yeah. or, uh, you know, like you said, a little bit lower basal area on the on the thinnings, uh, more fire, things like that, more more wildlife openings. So, hey, Doc, uh, I think Mac Thatcher's got a question he wanted to ask you. I know Mac's got a question. Yeah, about I've got a bunch of them, <laughs> yeah. but I, I'm going to go uh, more on the hunting side, uh, just from the records and studies. There's as hunters, as turkey hunters, we always want to get as close to the bird on the roost as we can. It's kind of been just beating your head since a young age. Do you see, uh, as far as your research goes, turkeys prefer to just step off the limb and hit the ground? Or do you think that they, they prefer to maybe fly a little ways? Or, or, or is that a, just a, such a variable thing? Or or what do you think is, is a turkey's, uh, I guess, habit? And it coming down off of the roost. Well, to one point, we can't really see that in our data because what happens is we get a, we have a roost location and then the next location that we get, he's already on the ground. So we don't really know how he got there. We just know that now he's, let's just say 200 yards from the roost and it's, you know, it's 30 minutes after he flew down or whatever. So that our data can't really, can't really tease that out. Um, what we do see, and it, and this kind of makes sense to me in many ways, is um, we do see, and again, the student teasing this out, well, I'll, I'll be able to speak better to this in the future, but we do see that, that there are some birds that will roost in places where if you just kind of look at it from their perspective, they could fly up they upslope, they could fly down, they could fly. I mean, they have options available to them, whether it be just dropping down off the roost, whether it be flying up onto the ridge, whether it be flying down into the bottom, whatever it is, they, they do seem in many cases to pick spots that gives them flexibility, which makes complete sense to me. Um, but I, beyond that, I don't know, other than my own observations, but again, you know, every time I, I think through in my head and go, 
why did he do that? I, I just circle back in my mind to Mike, stop thinking that that's him. It could be two hymns or three hymns or, you know, just stop trying to analyze, overanalyze this and understand that they're all different and they all have different strategies on today. And they, that strategy may be different tomorrow. Kind of, you know, are you on their agenda or not? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So you got a follow up to that, Mac? Yes, I, I do have one more. And this is, this is more on the conservation side. Uh, so we get phone calls all the time. Hey, what can I, what can I do in February for the turkeys? If there's one thing that you would say to someone that might not have as many, uh, options they might not be able to put fire lanes in they might not be able to light a fire or they might be away from their property what are some things that people can do with i guess a little opportunity uh, to really benefit the habitat for the the wild turkey if you're if you're thinking about february uh start thinking about that in the summer so if you're if you in other words if you want to benefit turkeys in whatever month, you need to understand what they're doing that month, uh, what they're eating that month, and then start back calculating when when can I influence what they're doing in that month. So like right now in my neck of the woods, um, with all the oaks, you know, the acorns are gone. They're on green forage plots. They're they're anywhere they can get green succulent vegetation that's where they're at and y'all know this you know in the, in the south at least we start getting these these days where things are a little warmer you start seeing insects emerge um so if i were thinking february i would be thinking okay chances are if there's still acorns on the ground they're using acorns but they're also going to use green forage what could i do to make sure there's succulent green vegetation on my property in February. Well, is it I'm strip disking, you know, in a previous month? Is it I'm planting a you know a forage plot? What is it? Uh, is it a perennial clover plot that I could that I could manage and 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 make sure it's it's succulent green in February? That would be my answer to that question. Just try to figure out what they should be doing that month. And make sure the resources they need are on your property. Yeah, that that's a good one. And, and well, I, I think that perennial clover probably fits that bill pretty uh, pretty well. So, look, I've got a question al- along the hunting lines, and this may be one of those that uh, you know your friend Bronson. Typically, <laughs> when, typically when I ask him a question, the answer is it depends. And yeah, that's a classic Bronson answer. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just want to pick your brain just a little bit. So if you're walking in in the dark, you've got a turkey roosted, and you walk in there and sit down to him, and you you feel pretty confident that he, that, that he or one of his buddies is there, how many times do you let him gobble up in that tree before you say, okay, here, I'm, I'm over here with a tree call? And it, Are you going through a, I want to let him know pretty quick? Are you trying to be the last thing that he, he gets to hear before he makes up his mind? What What's going through your mind there? My strategy, and I'm not saying this is right, because um, I get fooled more often than not, but I usually try to wait until I think he's a few minutes from flying down. And, and then I'll let him know I'm there, usually with, a super, super subtle call, almost to the point where it's inaudible to me um, because they can hear so well when they're in the tree and, and their hearing is so acute. Um, I tr- That's just been my philosophy. I, now, there have been, and actually I killed this bird. I remember a time where I had a bird that had a hen that was actually, she was on the other side of him from me and when she started yelping to him, he started going absolutely nuts. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm hosed. You know, this, this is ball game here. So I started making her mad. And she actually flew down and flew under him to come to me. Um, that's one time I got out of my own shell and said, Mike, you got to do things differently. And, 
and it worked that day. I don't know if that would ever work again, but it worked that day. And boy, I felt pretty, you know, felt pretty good about myself. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I was like, not only did I kill him, but I, I called her, you know, under him and man, that's you know, a pretty studly thing to do. And uh, yeah. probably, <laughs> probably the last bird I killed that year, actually, I, I think it was. So, uh, you know, there've been times through my, uh, turkey hunting career and i think this happened to me a bunch and when i was younger but i would yeah i've yelped too much at them in a tree and they seem to stay up in the tree yes. and, 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 and for a longer period of time goblin and yes. it then it gets to be frustrating out of, after a while and I, you know i think when i was younger uh, i would go ask somebody what did i do and they say well you got him too hot in the tree mm-hmm. that was kind of the response but so what's what's going on there is he waiting to for to see that hen or, very likely. Um, there's also the chance, and and we I've personally seen this on birds that that I've hunted repeatedly, and I, I think the the pressure that I was putting on that bird caused him to remain on that roost longer. And if you think about it from their perspective, that makes sense. If they're concerned, don't leave that tree because that tree is safe. There's no way you can get to him without him knowing you're, you know, that you're under him. So I think in some ways it's, I should be able to see her from where I'm at. The other thing is, you know, if I stay up here, I will see her. If that's her, if that, if if that's actually a bird, I'll see her because I'm, I'm up high. Um, I have a buddy that doesn't call to the bird until they fly down. Mm -hmm. I've heard that one. He well, I can't is, stand that. <laughs> I don't know how he does. It. I don't know. Um, he's a he's a hell of a turkey hunter too. Um, I just want my he name doesn't, in hand. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean he doesn't call. He does, and I don't know how he's so patient to do that. But he doesn't call until they fly down. And his thinking is, once he hit the ground, he didn't know I was there. I'm going to pique his interest as soon as his feet touch the ground, and. If I do that, sometimes he's going to say, wait a minute, what is that? I didn't know she was over there and come and come looking. And he, and he calls really quiet. He's very subtle. Um, again, he's a hell of a turkey hunter. Um, and I think there's a lot of validity to that because I've been with him when birds came. You know, it doesn't always work, but when it does, it, it was pretty clear that he hit that ground and he heard that hen and it was like, well, she I didn't know she was there. So I'm going to check her out. Yeah, and it, again, I, you know, we're talking about we're talking about an animal that there's no script for. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. it's like every one of them is every day. Every bird's different. It's that's what makes it so fun. I mean, to yeah, me, right, no doubt. You literally are like flipping a coin. You know, every day, which I think in many ways is why it's so addictive. Because you know, I'm a I, I love the deer hunt. I love the deer hunt. I love to eat deer. I love to chase deer. Killing a, a, a really nice buck is my, that's one of my true passions. Um, but it's, it is predictable in, in some ways, I think. And turkey hunting is so unpredictable. It's just so unpredictable. You just don't know. And to me, that's part of what makes it so much fun is no doubt about it. I have no idea what's going to happen today. And most of the time I ended up getting my tail kicked. But that was fun because he kicked my tail in a way I'd never had it kicked before. And um, that that's pretty that's pretty fun to me. I think we all go in with a plan about how this is going to go down. I know Bobby does because that's all he thinks about at night. But when I don't, has it ever worked out the way you thought it would? Occasionally. Ah, uh, whatever. <laughs> Occasionally. But it, it but it, and then when it doesn't work out, then you just you're like you just Life, can you speed through these twenty three hours so I can get right <laughs> yeah, back here in the morning and, and I'm reset? I'm gonna do this instead yeah. of that. Yeah, I, w- I wonder how many times I've you know been in the truck, defeated, just saying to myself, "I hate them. No. I hate turkeys." <laughs> I've yeah. got a buddy that'll text me every time. I'm done with them. I hate them, and then he'll go back the next day. Every time. Right. Well, I, I, to Bobby's to your question about the roosting, I, I have hunted a, a bird. Uh, if my buddy Mike listens to this, he'll, he'll be able to know with more clarity. We've hunted this bird several times. And again, I don't know that it's the same Turkey that's done this, but it's happened in the same spot twice to my knowledge. 
And both times this bird came in and when he got to where he thought he could see the hen, he should be able to see her, he flew up in a tree and sat there. And the first time it happened, I thought, man, that's a pretty slick strategy. And I was freezing and I, I was uncomfortable. And an hour later, he was still sitting there. And the second time it happened, he blindsided us and came in and quietly. And when he finally gobbled, he was so close to us, she couldn't move. And then we heard him fly up when he got to where he was about 70 yards, 75 yards from us, he flew up. And I've, I've thought back through the many years of turkey hunting I've done, and I've had that happen before where a bird got up to me and I think just, I should be able to see her and I can't. And I know one way that I can, I'll get up where I can see. And if I don't see her, nope, not going over there. I just thought to myself, this bird will die of old age. You know, I mean, I'll never kill this bird. And in many ways, I hope I don't, because the next time I go in there, he's going to kick my tail again. He's going to pull some other strategy. Um, and I'll stick that feather in my cap and hopefully learn from him. Well, that's happened to me a lot. I can tell you that, yeah, especially like, on public ground. Yeah, that's like those. Um, I've got a buddy that jokes that there's hidden speakers in the trees on some areas of public land, you hear that turkey gobbling all morning and then just gone. Yeah, or he stays in there. Yeah. I mean, he just doesn't leave. <laughs> you know, we always think that they're so paranoid, but they are just, it's, it's just that they have their own agenda, like uh, Mike was yeah, saying. every day's a new day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're so much fun. Yeah. We love them so much. And look, we're, we, we appreciate you being here. Is there... Does anybody have any more questions? Uh, I want to make sure, Mike, is there anything you want to say, anything you need to promote uh, or, or, or a message you want to get out here while we, we got you on? No, I, would, I mean, I would I would just say, um, I mean, and as turkey hunters, I, I think if we just made the decision that we're going to give more than we take, there you go. Um, I think if we do that in our own way, whether it, whatever that is, whatever giving is to you, whether it's money, whether it's your time, whether it's fire, habitat management, trapping, whatever it is, give more than you take. And if we all do that, the future looks pretty good for the bird. Yeah, well, we ought to be doing anyway. That's right. That's ex that's exactly right. Well, Dr. Michael Chamberlain, we've enjoyed having you on here. Uh, guys can follow you at Wild Turkey Doc if I'm not. If I think that's your handle there. Uh, yep. Turkey Tuesday. It's uh, he, he puts out some great information. No doubt. Look forward and, to it every uh, week. Look, we all uh, that you. I, I think I said at the beginning, you're our favorite guest. <laughs> what more can I, I say? That. I appreciate that. It, it either tells me that. You truly enjoy talking to me, or you don't have that many guests. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're better than Bronson. Let me just say that. Oh, okay, I, I love me some Bronson. Man. Bronson's a uh, he's a he's a class act. He uh, he really is. Yeah, Bronson's yeah. great. We pick on Bronson a lot. He's a, he's one of our favorite people for sure. So look, um, I don't I don't know if y'all follow the Onion on Facebook, but there was a recent Onion post that said Starkville, Mississippi. And it had something to do about deer, and there was some language, but it was it was hilarious. So if if you're an onion follower, go to it and check it out. I, I sent it to Bronson, and he was like, surprisingly, nobody sent this to me yet. But it, it was a good one. What's the onion? I, I don't know. It's a satirical. Uh, it's like a new, it's like a news source, <laughs> but it's a joke. Nonsense. I got you. Yeah, right. it's nonsense. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yeah. But it, it was a good one. Uh, well, Mike, thanks for being here. David, thanks for jumping on here with us. David Holly, he's got the Wild Turkey Report. You guys need to follow that. So uh, we appreciate having both of you guys on. Absolutely. Yeah, man. It's good being with you. All right. Take care. Thank you, guys. Thanks, we'll see guys. We appreciate it. Well, he, I, I just love talking to him about turkeys. And I can talk about turkeys all day. You know, I, I feel like I don't know anything but when it comes. I mean, he's so smart about them. Well, it's interesting just to, you know, hear his perspective on, especially like, like you, you go to bed after, in the middle of turkey season thinking about that turkey, and he's not thinking about you. 
He's yeah. waking up to a brand new day. <laughs> he really is. And that whole idea about it's different turkeys in that. Yeah, I think, and even George mentioned this. He said, I learned a long time, don't be scared of the turkey. You know what I mean? That's true. It's very true. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So, so uh, George is going to be around this week? Is yeah, that- we'll have him. He'll be on the next podcast that we're going to be doing. So what uh, have we got a, an Ask Dudley? We do. And it's turkey related. Oh, imagine look, that. Imagine yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> All right. You ready, Dud? Yeah. Mr. Dudley, with turkey season on the brain, we won't get to burn for the first time this year, but we've made a lot of progress towards making fire lanes for when we do. My question is what are some good oak trees to plant for turkeys? We have land in Winston County, Mississippi, about an hour from Mossy Oak. Thanks, Todd. All right, Todd. Um, yeah, I, I love thinking about turkeys and what they like to eat at different times of the year. And that's a good question. Um, and I think it would be a good answer for deer as well. Um, it seems like, you know, everybody thinks white oak, the white oak section or the group, white oak group is, is what they want to plant all over their place. And I, I think white oaks are great. I'm not knocking them, but uh, every time I see a whole bunch of scratching in late February and early March when I'm making a huge loop through the woods doing turkey scouting, I frequently find scratching underneath small acorn red oak trees. Mm-hmm. Um, and we we seem to overlook that uh, even, you know, uh, my buddy Mariah Bogus did some cool uh, studies with upland red oak, specifically for deer. But I think it has a lot of merit uh, with turkeys as well. You know, they, they seem to get avoided, especially on years where there's a high uh, white oak crop. And uh, they sit there, but they have more tannins in them, and they don't sprout right away. So the acorns last longer in the leaf litter. They're also a lot smaller, harder for maybe fall into a little crevice or something, harder for a deer to get. But uh, more often than not, whether it be upland reds or bottomland reds, that's where you'll find turkeys if any of them remain at that time of the year. Mm. And so uh, if you're thinking about planting trees or you're managing uh, your, your naturally occurring oaks that are already there, Think about managing for or planting more of those small acorn reds. Um, Some good examples uh, in the south, um, let's see, I've got this written down so I don't miss one. Uh, Water oak, willow oak, and cherry bark oak are are good ones to plant uh, in drainages and and bottom ground. Uh, Cherry bark you can even plant a little bit further up the hill. And then your upland reds in the south that are important, uh, southern red, um, black oak, and scarlet oak are some good. And there's some more that are less common. Um, uh, Swamp laurel oak, we're going to try to start growing that. That's another good bottomland one for the south. Um, And in the north, uh, pin oak is a good one. And and you can often find that in uplands and bottomlands. Shingle oak is another good small acorn red, and then also black and scarlet. So th- those are some good ones to think about planting or managing for. So, Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Know-it-all. I got Thank a, you, I, Mr. Know-it-all. I have a double up. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so uh, I've always thought about the acorn size, but I never thought about what you were talking about. The red oaks, if I'm understanding you correctly, kind of preserve themselves better because of the high rate of tannins in them? I guess that's, you know, I, I don't study all the chemistry. I, I let I let these Ph.D. folks uh, learn all of that. But, uh, yeah, I think it's the well, tannins I mean, it and the acres. makes sense what I've seen in the woods, 100%, yeah. so I just never realized that. Right, and and white oak, uh, post oak is a small acre in white that, that turkeys eat, and it'll sprout and send down a root, but something could still scratch that up and eat the cotyledons, which is the, the meat of the acorn, which is the first true leaf. So gotcha. uh, some chemical changes have taste, take, taken place, but it's still something edible that something could scratch up and eat. So. Yeah, and I know we touched on it, but the, again, how important we're figuring out that 
hard mast is during the winter months for spring survival is, is huge. So. And yeah, and I don't know, it, it it's variable in different parts of the country, but we had a rough acorn crop this year around mm-hmm. here. Um, the two species that I'm finding occasionally that did have a decent crop are the water oaks and the willow oaks down in the bottoms mm-hmm. and, and almost Overlap. nothing else. What uh, led to that? Because we had a lot of rain this summer. It's... Uh, well, that's a tough it one depends. to get into. <laughs> yeah. yeah, could be late frost, could be drought. You know, uh, there's so many different cycles. Too much that, water. Yeah, that affect uh, things. And you know, it takes a red oak two years to produce a mature acorn, a white one. So that comes into play as well. Hmm. It depends. So Always small learning. acorn wow. reds. Always learning. That's right. Well, that's good, Dudley. You taught us something guys pay attention to that they can always learn something from you i learn on something from them every day yeah, yeah we, we do. <laughs> i'm not sure good, good, or bad. good or bad that's right, right. <laughs> uh, look i want to apologize if you listen to this and you're hearing all kind of stomping got a little construction going yeah then they're walking over the top of us and they don't they don't understand what we're doing in here but we so. might have more than one toilet soon so i sure hope so that's, that's exciting yeah, or, time. either that or we need to get the key from to clay's yeah. from clay he's locking his bathroom that's wrong so, guys, this has been a lot of fun. Is there anything else? Mac, you got anything? We would like to – we do want to mention Gamekeeper Fieldwear, guys. Uh, it's right now. Uh, you can go to GamekeeperFieldwear.com and look at some of the Gamekeeper hunting clothing or go to the uh, – you know, some of the better sporting goods stores are stocking the Gamekeeper Fieldwear now. And that would be uh, – uh, we'd appreciate, guys, if you would check that out. Mac, you got anything else to add? Yeah, so just uh, obviously go to your uh, local dealers and uh, GamekeeperFieldWare.com uh, with turkey season right around the corner. A lot of that gear gets uh, gets purchased pretty quickly, so I, I'd check it out while we got it for sure. Lanny, you got anything to add before no, we get off here? No, I'm just, you know, super pumped about turkey season as always and what we can do to uh, help them out. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm mad at them. I hear you. I'm not mad at them. I'm not either. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing one. Yeah, well, me too. I was mad at them a few years ago, but got that all over my system. Yeah. Well, so, America. No, I think Dudley just upset he missed so many times last year. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think he's okay. mad at himself, but he's transposing it on the, the turkeys. Is that it? That is it. <laughs> I got some catching up to do. And I got to get hey, little Dudley a turkey. Yeah, Help me him too. get one. Yeah, you hey, do. all three of us here aren't looking too good from last season. So. No, but I'm hearing there's, there's, uh, I'm getting good reports. So, uh, the, well, I'll let you know on the opening youth weekend of the dummy line. That's what I'm worried about. So, <laughs> I sure am. So, look, America, we hope that we are helping you be a better gamekeeper. We certainly Absolutely. have discussed some stuff and we hope that we're inspiring you. So, uh, to, to help your property, whether you've got uh, spring habitat or fall or winter habitat. So, uh, here we go. Uh, Why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Mac Mac. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.